Welcome back. The Crown wrapped up its case this week against an admitted serial killer in Winnipeg. Lawyers for Jeremy Skibitsky say he is not criminally responsible due to a mental illness. The trial is now on hiatus until June 3rd. For more, we're joined by our reporters T.R. Wheatley and Kathleen Martins, who have been sitting in the courtroom every day. Here, TR and Kathleen, and for all the work you've been doing on this, uh, TR, we'll start with you. You worked with the MMIWG inquiry. Are you finding similarities inside the courtroom as to what you heard when, back when you were traveling the country with the inquiry? Uh, yeah, Dennis. In a way, it kind of feels like five years haven't even passed. Um, you know that. Uh, the report was delivered in 2019, and right in the intro, it talked about how Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit, were being forced to confront violence on a daily basis uh, while perpetrators act with impunity. And I mean, this is playing out right now in the courtroom. I mean, right from day one, we heard the interrogation tape, um, you know, from a visibly white male who says he had targeted um, homeless shelters for the Indigenous women. Um, you know, at one point we heard from a worker that also worked in that shelter who told us that the, ma the man that's in the trial now, um, he didn't even need to be there. He had his own place and that he just went there to stalk his victims. So, you know, putting that into context from, you know, this trial and then working at the inquiry, um, you know, you're seeing similarities definitely. So when I actually worked at the inquiry, I had a twofold kind of job. I worked with the commissioners, um, but I also did statement gathering. And, you know, most of the family members and survivors of violence that I had the chance to get, gather their statements for, you know, they all, you know, they all had their own stories, of course, but there were similarities right in that storyline. You know, they were pretty similar there. They each told me that society viewed them as less than worthy um, and that perpetrators always felt safe enough to continue to do what they were doing to them. So, um, you know, putting that into context, uh, a lot of the calls to justice, you know, focused on the lack, the lack of basic human needs. Um, and again, that's playing out in this very trial, you know. Um, you know, I had the chance to check in with two of the commissioners. Um, you know, I, I continue to keep, you know, keep in touch with them after all that hard work that they did. Um, you know, and, and they say the same thing that, you know, the very things that they talked about five years ago, it's still playing out. Um, one thing though that I've noticed uh, in court is the families, they're getting some supports. Um, you know, we've reported on that. They've been getting some money from the federal government and uh, the province, um, you know, to help with their mental health. So I guess in that small way, one of those um, calls to justice were answered, at least here in Manitoba. Uh, Kathleen, you know, uh, you've covered numerous trials over the years. Uh, can you give us a sense on how this one might be different uh, from previous ones? Yeah, pretty much in every way. You know, I've, I've, I've never covered one where the accused confessed, but n not really. You know, the, Mr. Skavicki has said that he did it, he committed the murders, but he should be found not criminally responsible due to a mental disorder. So then we're still having the trial, the Crown is still trying to prove that he is criminally responsible and, and wasn't mentally ill at the time. And so it's, that is very different where we can refer to him in our uh, media coverage as the killer or the murderer or the self-confessed killer. Um, and yet we still have to observe all the legal and journalistic principles when it comes to covering court. Yeah, TR, as a, a Cree woman and journalist, what's it like being in the courtroom with the families, hearing details that I'm sure you know, we haven't even reported on? Yeah, Dennis, um, the easiest way to say it, it's this um, struggle of trying to walk this imaginary line, uh, this imaginary line, you know. Um, you know, part of that as media, myself, you know, in those calls to justice from the National Inquiry were calls to us, you know, and, and, and it was, you know, challenging us to stop victimizing these Indigenous women who have already been victimized. So, you know, I think of those families that are in that courtroom, but I also think about the families across the country and my own family as well, you know, because we've also experienced this type of violence, you know, and then it's trying to find that balancing act. What do we show? And I'll give you an example of that. 
Um, you know, in court, we've seen the interrogation video of Mr. Skibitsky himself, um, you know, admitting to this. And, you know, I've, I've struggled with showing it because there's that public right to know, but it's also, you know, what, you know, in my coverage, at least anyway, and APTN has been supportive of me of this. I've never given him sound bites, you know, where you actually hear you speak from him. We've shown his video, but, you know, I'm trying to be more trauma-informed to these families that way. So, you know, it's balancing that, um, you know, and then even having that video, I would much rather have video or photos of, you know, these women that we've lost. But again, there's that breakdown and, you know, a lot of these families don't trust us with those intimate, you know, mm -hmm. photos of their beautiful loved ones and whatever else. So, you know, sometimes we don't even have those. Um, you know, so again, it's that constant struggle. Myself is an Indigenous woman who's experienced violence. You know, it's not about me, but at the same time, this, this whole thing is showing that, that um, the issue, the stronger issue about violence against Indigenous women and girls, um, you know, and then it's also trying to find that safe balance, you know. Um, you know, I've chosen not to be specific in terms of certain body parts, um, although in two different reports I, I did, I was specific, but I felt like, you know, that was important to know, like, you know, you, you hear, we heard about this um, person, this garbage picker who, you know, was just walking by and he opened up the garbage and there was a female, you know, a female body part and it's just, you know, it's finding that balance. Um, as well in the courtroom, uh, Mr. Skibitsky walks into the courtroom and out of the courtroom alongside where we as journalists are sitting and all of us just, just have to decide, do we want to look at him? Do we want to try to meet his eye? And I've spoken to TR about that because she's the most visibly Indigenous journalist in the group. And what has that been like? Has she looked at him? And she can tell you what she did. See, I'd... She looked at him right in the eye and held his gaze. And she told me later, as an Indigenous woman, how important that was for her. It's something the victims aren't around to do anymore. And she felt that she needed to do that. And she did. Well, again, Kathleen T.R., thanks to you both for speaking with us about this trial and for all the work you've been doing here over the coming er, last few weeks and, and the weeks to come when things resume on June 3rd. Thanks again. You're welcome, Dennis. Thanks.